the route out of the army, if you like, was um, it was less of a blur, and, and that's because um, it was so difficult. I think that I remember the stages, and 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 it's seared on my memory, if you like. Um, what happened was that uh, while serving in Italy around 2006, 2007, um, I started getting the symptoms of what turned out to be bowel cancer. Um, but it wasn't picked up in the, we were being looked after by um, a NATO medical center. And that's, you know, it's not to point the finger of blame at, mm. at that medical center, but for whatever reason, those, those symptoms were put down to, uh, I can't remember even what it was. It just wasn't bowel cancer. Mm. Um, and so it wasn't till about a year later or maybe 18 months later when I came back to the UK that I went uh, to see the local um, civilian medical practitioner. So uh, the doctor that was in the army medical center in Upaven where I was at the time, um, realized something was wrong, sent me down to Salisbury District Hospital for tests, which diagnosed the bowel cancer. And within a month, uh, the tumor that they had found was cut out. Um, so I'd had major, major abdominal surgery and in typical military fashion, thought, right, I can't let this knock my BFT times. Sure. So I was doing, sit, you know, trying to make sure the sit-ups like, were still sort of being banged out, and the press-ups and the, and the uh, BFT run, etc. Um, and clearly trying to do sit-ups with someone having removed a significant proportion of your abdominal muscles was mm -hmm. a bit more of a challenge. Not to worry. I thought, I won't let this small matter of bowel cancer become an issue. Cracked on through it, got posted from Uphaven up to the Army Personnel Centre in Glasgow. Uh, and within five months of the job, stood to attention um, during the two-minute silence on the Remembrance Parade that we had there in, on the 11th of November, not surprisingly, in APC Glasgow. Um, my hands started tingling. I started having, uh, I started hyperventilating. Still maintained my stood to attention posture. We got fallen out, went and sat down on a, on a bench that was uh, in the quadrangle there and just, well, I, it turns out I had a panic attack, but to me it was like, what's going on? I don't know what's going on here. But I'd noticed that, as I put it, you know, things have been sort of going downhill and falling apart a bit on, up to that point. I'd not been sleeping well. It turns out they're typical sort of signs of depressive, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the depressive symptoms, not sleeping well, appetite all over the place, withdrawing, you know, just going back to the flat that um, the MOD had sort of rented me in Glasgow, staying there, not going out, um, not wanting to talk to people at work, really, um, just being overwhelmed with things. Uh, and that was a kind of culmination of that. And I realized that the wheels were going to come off spectacularly if I didn't do something about it. So when I saw the MO, the medical officer, um, who um, said, right, okay, well, it's not surprising your, the wheels might be coming off. You've been through a serious illness. You just cracked on it in typical military tradition, as I said, but the worst possible way. Uh, you haven't had time to process everything. You're knackered. You're exhausted. Um, so they monitored it for a bit, but it, 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 it wasn't going well. So I was sent home on, on, on leave um, for three months. Um, and a graduated return to to work program was instituted from there, perhaps a bit too late. But at that stage, uh, the, the, the medical um, authorities decided that, uh, that in combination with the bowel cancer and the, what, what was the diagnosis turned out to be was um, adjustment disorder with mixed anxiety and depressed mood, that that was the end of the career. So I was medically discharged in, in 2011. Um, physically, no problem. But in losing the career, losing the identity, not knowing what I was going to do with my professional life or even, you know, it's not just about, you know, the, the army, I think the point is the army and the military is more than just a job. Um, it was an identity, you know, you're wearing that and, and living and breathing that every day. You're wearing a, a uniform with rank and cap badge, etc., on it and everything screams identity. You carry an identity card with your rank on it and your picture and, and everything else. All of that is taken away from you, along with your, your monthly salary, your house, your, your, you know, your, your three meals a, a day, schooling for your children, um, family infrastructure as well, and family is a very important part of this transition process. Uh, and suddenly you're left you know, a second after midnight 
becoming a civilian, the very thing that the previous 20 years you were told you're better than. Uh, this is not an argument about whether military people are or aren't. Yep. But that's the... It's the that's idea a, you're given in order to motivate you to precisely. go through these extremes. Yeah. You've got to do crazy stuff. Mm. And thankfully, the military exists to do the crazy stuff so that civilian society can function without having to worry about that in safety, security, etc. We all we know that. And we, we go to do that willingly. It doesn't mean it's not scary. It doesn't mean that unfortunate things happen um, and tragedy occurs, of course. But we know what we're signing up for. Um, and, and the point is that to get people to do that, you've got to create in them an identity and a sense of almost invincibility and specialness and otherness. Um, and a great deal of investment in terms of um, money and time and training uh, goes into inculcating that sense in, in military people from recruit training onwards. Not nearly enough, I would argue, goes in deconditioning people for return to civilian life. So to go back to the story, a second after midnight on, I think it was the 12th of August, again, I can remember these dates mm -hmm. pretty clearly, uh, 2011, I suddenly became a civilian again. No job, no, no idea how things were going to pan out. And that was really difficult. That's the, the, the journey is very common with a, a lot of the veterans, especially veterans who've gone through a, a traumatic experience, whether it be a life-threatening condition, whether it be physical or, or, me, or a, a medical condition. And that'll bring me on to, can you, can you explain a little bit more about the studies that you've been doing? You, you, you're studying veterans? Transition. Transition. And, and you're doing a doctorate in veterans yeah. transition. Can you explain a little bit more about what you've been studying and where it's taken you? Yeah. Um, what I'm... The doctorate for me, first of all, it's a doctorate in education. So it's a professional uh, doctorate. So instead of PhD, it's e, capital E, small d, big D. So it's doctorate in education. And that's important. And I'm, I emphasize that because the reason I started doing it was manifold in many respects, but very briefly. Um, whilst in the army, I was fortunate to do a couple of uh, master's degrees. Um, one, of, one was a master's in education, which was to do with my professional role as, a, as an army education officer. So when I'd left, and as I said, I was kind of left work, trying to work out what to do, um, I thought, well, I can sign up for a course at the local university. Um, and with two masters already, it didn't strike me as a good use of my time or, or anyone else's to do another master's. So the, the next step, if you like, was a doctorate. Um, and so I thought, what, you know, so what, what can I do it in? The local university in, in Canterbury where I'm where I'm based, I grew up in Canterbury, and that's, that's important as well. Important very briefly, because I went back there to lick my wounds, you know, it was mm -hmm. a sense of safety, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. That features in the, the doctoral study as well. Anyway, uh, local university, doctorate in education, so there's a professional link, and I thought, well, this, this can, I can possibly sort of use this as a means to get work in academia or, or, or wherever it happens to be. So there was a kind of semblance of a plan developing. But perhaps more importantly, I discovered it could provide a vehicle for me to try and work out these transition issues in, for my own sake, because I was having great difficulty working out why I was feeling so cut adrift, if you like, and lost. Mm. But also, it gave me a sense of purpose and value. And I think you'll recognize it in the military, you know, we're so, it, it, the motto at Sandhurst is serve to lead. You know, you are serving to, um, you're serving other people. And as an education officer, you're, you're you're encouraging people to get involved in education. And that never left me. So I thought that the doctorate could also be a, a vehicle for me to give something back to those people like me who found transition difficult by exposing my own um, difficulties because in reading about other people's, I felt less lonely and less abnormal. Okay, so I'm not a freak. I'm, I'm going through a process that hundreds of thousands of other people go through. Mm -hmm. And I've got similar emotions going on and similar, uh, similar challenges. So I can work through that and by exposing that. You know, it's Mental Health Awareness Week at the moment. And by talking about it, people feel less lonely. So I wanted to do that. And secondly, I wanted to come up, as an educator, I wanted to come up with strategies that I could perhaps recommend to other people, other veterans, the MOD, whoever it happens to be, um, that I think should be incorporated in what is currently called resettlement training, but I think should be called transition training. Because mm -hmm. currently resettlement training is acknowledged by academic literature to focus on um, 
the acquisition of a second job after the military, which is very, very important. Most of us, vast majority, we need, we need income. That second job provides a reason to get up in the morning, a sense of value and purpose, except where we don't find that job gives us value and purpose. And if we find that is the case, academic literature and my own experience suggests that that, that loss of meaning and purpose can create psychological issues in its, in its own right. And if you're dealing with trauma, be it um, physical trauma, limb amputation, whatever it happens to be, um, and psychological trauma, PTSD, whatever it happens to be, one can affect the other. Mm. And if you're, not, if you're not feeling that you're doing something valuable, whether it be involved in sport in Invictus Games or you know, there are archaeological digs that are, are, are geared up for veterans that can go and do something meaningful and valuable. All, all manner of um, provision for veterans, gardening courses, whatever, the course that, if, if I may be so bold, you're doing. Yes, yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the media course, yeah. yeah. Um, if, it gives us, if, it, if it gives us something that we enjoy and we feel is valuable and meaningful and a reason to get up, then that can help us with all those other sorts of transitionary issues. Um, contrastingly, without that, that loss of meaning and purpose can affect our psychological state. Our, any physical issues can affect our psychological state. The psychological state can be such that it can create physical conditions. That can again feed back onto the psychological state and it just becomes a mess. And tragically, that sort of mess can end up in um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, not just it's not just a cause of homelessness, but can, you know, it can, it can, it can create uh, breakdowns of in family breakdowns, for example, which can create, can be a reason for homelessness. And ultimately, tragically, it can lead to suicide. And there, there are indicators that that can be involved in veteran suicides. The, we've got the issues at the moment with veteran suicides. And I, we predicted when I left the military service that there would, within the next decade, be a crisis with veterans' mental health, with the operational tempo of a decade ago to now. I want to come on to resilience, military resilience. Now, recruits in training now are receiving men, uh, mental resilience training for their operational commitments, whether they get whether young, young men and women going on to operational deployments. How can this be taken on the journey through the career and then into, into, into becoming a veteran? And the first thing to say is, well, first of all, that, that is really important. The mental health resilience training, and I'm, I'm not hugely familiar with it because I'm looking at um, transition out as opposed to the, the sort of resilience you need to operate in the armed forces. Um, that has been better catered for um, than the resilience needed to transition out. Clearly, um, it, it needs to be better catered for, and, and there are studies that are, are focusing on that at the moment and programs such as the one you mentioned that are, that are attempting to deal with that. And that's laudable and right. But the point I would make is that the, the sort of resilience you need to survive on operations is different than the resilience you need to survive in transitioning from the military to civilian operations or civilian life. Um, because thankfully, the sort of experiences you're gonna have in the civilian world, and particularly in transition, are different from the experiences you're gonna have in high intensity operations, for example, uh, in the military sphere, it's not the same. You know, dealing with the Taliban is different from working out where to find, and it sounds glib, I know, but working out where to find a house, where to accommodate the family, where to school your children, where uh, some, some transitioning military people don't know that you have to pay council tax. The first, thing they, the first time they realize they have to pay council ta taxes when they get a summons yeah. to go to court because uh, they've not I, paid it. I, you know, my, my first knowledge of how to do self-assessment was at 35 years of age. Now, this leads me back to, do, uh, with the military training, I know the military does have to, you know, uh, commitments to develop soldiers and, and service personnel to do a job. Are they letting service personnel down in the longer term by not educating them on these aspects? Should, should as you say, the veterans transition be longer? And what, what could be... What could they focus on to strengthen service personnel leaving and give them a, a, a better chance of success, success post-service? Um, I, I would I'd hesitate to say that the MOD is letting service people down. I think, I think they, 
arguably that criticism could be levied or leveled, sorry. Um, but I, I mean, my experience of working in, in the, the MOD and the army is that, you know, people ultimately are trying to do their best. They're not deliberately going out to, to make people's lives difficult, unless you're the enemy, <laughs> clearly the objective. But uh, certainly in terms of looking after service people, um, without exception, and I've, you know, I've never met anyone in the army or any of the three services or the MOD, whether it be military or civilian, that are, are going out to, you know, make life difficult for service people. But I think it is acknowledged that more could be done to help military leaders, as I term them in my thesis, um, to better prepare for the point at which they leave and be more resilient in order to cope with some of the challenges that some, perhaps many, military leaders and veterans find in that transition process. And the way I think that can happen is Firstly, switching this mindset from resettlement training to transition training, because it's, it's difficult to know when a transition starts and when it ends. You could say that it starts, the transition process starts as soon as someone presses, I want to leave on JPA. Um, when it ends, who knows? Mine hasn't ended yet. I left in 2011. Um, so it should be transition training. And the point is, and it comes back to resilience, that... You can't train everyone for every possible challenge they might find in transition, but what you can do is enable them to build a, a core, a foundation of resilience and give them strategies, coping strategies, or, or help them know how they can develop or where they can go for help to develop those coping strategies by educating them about them in transition training. Mm -hmm. Um, and so where the focus is currently on getting a job, which as, we, as we've acknowledged is very important, it should also be on, and these are some of the other emotional issues and practical issues that you might encounter along the way. Practical issues, you know, finances, paying um, council tax, opening a bank account, housing, fine. That, that is catered for to a degree. And, I, and I'm, I understand there are plans in place to further improve that. There is also in the, in the MOD an acknowledgement that emotional issues can be a challenge and they can be catastrophic, catastrophic if not dealt with or, or if people aren't resilient enough to cope with it, suicide being a case in point. Um, but it's not there yet. The, the, the um, ability to the training or the educational aspect, I don't believe, is there. And therefore, people are not leaving with sufficiently robust tools and they're not leaving with enough tools because it's about a number of tools to be able to think about what they need to do in certain situations as they arise in transition. You know, that's a dynamic process. It's a possibly never ending process. And it's also dynamic because of the things that people might encounter along the way that can, they can find um, a challenge. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's about educating people about themselves and the sorts of things they can do to better meet those challenges and better weather them and be more resilient when they do, um, and also where they can go to, for help. We, um, we discussed with Tobias Elwood last week about um, veterans going through the transition process and as well as having a physical um, you know, assessment when leaving service, there should also be a mental health assessment. Uh, obviously taking a, a service person through their career journey and on leaving the military and maybe even having some sort of traffic light system as to how vulnerable they would be to mental health crisis post-service. With, with, with regards to PTSD and as, although I'm physically injured, the guys that looked after me and, and, and helped me, some of them colleagues suffered with PTSD and I've met with them since serving and that has really impacted them in their quality of life going forward. What can be done? What can be done to, and I'll go on, go on to post-traumatic growth, to, to flip that around? I know they go through these extreme traumatic experiences, but what can be done to use it as an energy for good? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, PTSD is, is a very significant um, and serious issue. Um, and of course, it can be diagnosed, if you like, or at least suspected. Um, to be present in, 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 in people's lives um, and certainly military or serving personnel's lives before they leave. Some of the symptoms may be obvious and that may be picked up and, and there are screening checklists and, and um, 
clinical measures, and I'm not a clinical expert, so this is not an area I'm, I'm an, ex an expert in by consequence of that. Um, but I understand what you're saying, that, that measures can be put in place to, to assess people and to see whether there's any form of um, psychological vulnerability or issue there. I guess the problem is that some of the symptoms may not be present when those diagnostic tools are used. Some people may not, because of stigma, stigma is an issue, and the MOD acknowledging that, may have worked out how to not allow themselves to be flagged up as a problem because they're worried that you know, they may not get a job because they're seen as a bit of a fruitcake when they leave. Mm -hmm. um, so they may, they, they may not be picked up as a point. So how do we flip that? I think by instituting a transition program, which is broader, as I suggested, than resettlement, which by exposing everyone, irrespective of perceived need, to the sorts of coping strategies that I, I briefly mentioned, but also where they can seek help, and also educating them about the need to seek help rather than let it run its tragic course and some of the things happen that we, we talked about before. Um, and by everyone having to attend those courses, and I don't know how long those courses need to be, I haven't got that far in my kind of working it out, but if it's obligatory, so you will have, and the military is very good at making people have to do things, so if it is, then stigma won't be an issue because everyone will go. Um, people might learn something on it, coping strategies, where to go for help, how to deal with PTSD, potentially, certainly where to get help, etc. And during that, people may open up because it, it, it has been shown that if you're working among peers who may encourage each other to be open about their problems, and you realize you're not alone, I, I mentioned that before, as soon as you realize that you're not abnormal, you're not alone, mm -hmm. you, you tend to become more open about it. And with appropriate clinical and educational support in place, I think there's a greater chance of any issues being, or potential issues being picked up during that transition phase. And then specialist treatment can be arranged for those people should they need it um, at the time, or at least they can be monitored going forward. And I think that, would, that is, stands a better chance of either mitigating potential problems in the future or certainly picking them up before they happen and before the tragedies that we um, identify can happen, do happen. And that, that to me has got to be cheaper. Mm -hmm. The investment needed to just expand that resettlement process into a, I call it a psychoeducational um, transition course, has got to be cheaper than picking up the pieces of uh, family breakdown and, and you know supporting people in unemployment or underemployment or healthcare, um, or the, the social and, and emotional costs involved in um, suicide, tragically. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's going to cost a bit more money, but it's, and, the figures suggest it's a lot it's, less. And it's worth, uh, we were talking about this last week uh, with the Veterans Minister, it's, it's worth for the whole of the military community, in investing in your veterans, so the younger population, those that are joining the forces, know that they're getting looked after. Uh, what what is the, what do you think the current mood is regarding the uh, the military being looked after post service and that impact on recruits joining and retention and, and, and across across and general morale across the military? Anecdotally, and I haven't got um, research evidence to support this. It, it may well be out there, but anecdotally. Um, in fact, there have been reports that indicate that there's an issue, put it this way, that reports have identified attention. What the military is trying to do is decrease issues of stigma being a barrier to people who do need help in the, in the forces in terms of mental health, accessing that help. We, we've talked about the need to be resilient in the military because of the sort of stuff that the military have to do. That Unfortunately, and it's not just the military, there's a, there's a wider societal issue of stigma as well in terms of mental health, and that's why we're exposing these issues in Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, but that stigma can prevent people seeking help when they need it. Um, that was part of my problem. I, I cracked on and I sensed that something was going wrong, but I didn't want to lose my career. Ultimately, I did lose my career. That's the irony. Perhaps if I'd sought help earlier, I'd still be in the military. Who knows? Stigma played a part, certainly, in my mm -hmm. medical discharge. And we need, to, we need to deal with that. But the problem is that in, in raising awareness about stigma and mental health, 
it has created the impression, research reports suggest, in wider society that all veterans are affected by psychological issues and mental health issues both in and after service. The problem is that that may fuel the perception among, among wider society that veterans are mad, sad and bad, mm -hmm. these reports say. So mad because they've had traumatic experiences, sad, depressed as a consequence and uh, bad because they go around smashing things up because they're depressed. Um, that's clearly not the case. The military invests a great deal of time, as we've identified, in training us to do all sorts of very, very useful things. And it's not about going, going and dealing with the Taliban. That, that, that's, that's ultimately what a, an armed force is designed to do. But there's an awful lot of stuff that has to be in place before that happens. You know, engineering, logistics, medical support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I've, forgive me when I've, I've missed a whole lot of people <laughs> out there, of course. Everyone's important. Um, and that means there's a lot of skills from engineering to veterinary care to dentistry to, to, other, to other medical support, um, all sorts of other things. Um, and those skills can be deployed in civilian life as well to great effect. And so by creating the impression that all veterans are mad, sad and bad, that may have a knock-on effect that employers are missing out on that great wealth of talent that means that veterans might be finding it more difficult to find work. That means that they may not be finding the meaning and purpose that they seek in their life after the military. That may, means it may cause psychological issues. That means it may cause physical issues, which may feed back into psychological it issues. Cycle, isn't it? So all of this needs to be dealt with. And it's yeah. not easy. I don't think anyone is pretending it's easy. And if it, were, if it were, then we would have resolved it. But that's why we're having this discussion, because we need to think about it. We need to talk about it. We need to analyze it and work out ways um, to, to, to manage this and to help people, both in dealing with psychological issues as well as getting, not fueling a perception that, that all veterans are mad, sad and bad. And that ultimately is why we're doing academic research so that we can come up with practical policy. There's always a political dimension to any research. So we, we can uh, enact political uh, ergo policy change based on sound research evidence um, that can then change how we practically engage with military uh, leavers in transition and veterans to avoid as many of these problems as we can. I look back at my military career and I can honestly say that I, I worked with some of the most resilient, uh, motivated people that I've come across in my life. They were extremely uh, effective in their job. They were very, you know, very good at what they did in uniform uh, and, and again we call say the best of the best we were the, you know the army be the best what how can the um, the that um, motivation that and again they've also also been through some of them in uh, you know traumatic experiences we talk about post-traumatic growth and so you're taking this person that was very very very, very strong in what they did as, as a service person again a very difficult job what how can that be transferred into being successful as a civilian? You know, we, we want somebody not just to go and live a civilian life and eke along an existence, but we want people to have a successful life, as a well-deserved successful life as a civilian. How can, what, what's, what, what, what would your advice be on that about, the, about using post-traumatic growth or? I think it, it comes back to harnessing that, that sense of meaning, value and purpose that all military personnel, I, I can't think of any exceptions, um, enjoyed in their military careers. There was a reason to get up, um, if not just to do something um, perceived as valuable among like-minded people who, who ultimately were, were all doing their bit for the same thing. Now, of course, you know, we all did things in the military that may have, you know, seemed, we, 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 the military humour, you know, um, pern painting curbstones, whether that went on or not, I don't know, but, you know, sort of, the punishment duty, you know, yeah. may not have seemed like it had much meaning and value at the time. But actually, when you think about it, there was a there was a, a meaning to it. It's like screw up, you get to do that. Don't screw up, then you you know you're fully one of the team, and, and in being fully one of the team, you're you're the team is working together to achieve something meaningful and valuable overall. So you know we never lost sight of that, and I think it's a question of harnessing that desire to to work as a part of a team and to, towards some sort of common good, some sort of common goal. 
And as I say, which, that, that's almost in our DNA. You know, it's, it, I, I think a lot of people join the military because they recognize that they want to do that in themselves. And they see that the military is a, is a, a vehicle for them to be able to, uh, to achieve that. You're then trained to do it, you do it, and then when you leave, it's, it's just, it's inbuilt. And so, you know, you are military or veterans, by and large, are motivated and want to carry that through and want to be valuable, to give value, to, uh, and to be doing something meaningful uh, and, and with a purpose. And so if, if civilian employers can harness that, then they're onto a winner because they're gonna have someone who's just, right, yeah, not a problem. I can deal with this and I will drive it forward for you. And that's the strength. So in terms of post-traumatic growth, for all of us that have been through tricky times, whether it be physical, um, psychological, or even you know, if you don't think you've been through a tricky time in the military, but you're just having a bit of a bumpy ride in transition, the growth can come from reflecting on those issues. Again, I'm not an expert on PTSD, but I understand that ways of dealing with it, you know, co cognitive behavioral therapy is about sort of realizing where the trauma is coming from, the, the, the experience that is creating you to have flashbacks, uh, um, creating the, the, the flashbacks, etc. And it's just about the fact that you haven't kind of, the, the, the brain hasn't, or the mind hasn't processed it, hasn't integrated it um, into your current psyche. And so it's unresolved and it's in the past and it keeps coming back and saying, Hi, I'm here, you need to deal with me. Um, you know, and I didn't have PTSD as far as I'm aware, but I had issues about the way that my military career ended that I needed to deal with. And the way I've done that is by writing about it in the thesis and working it through. And so there's a, there's a thinker called Neymar who talks about narrative repair and post-traumatic growth, and I'm using him in the, in the thesis. Mm -hmm. And it's about just kind of, it's integrating those issues, whether it be PTSD types issues, or in my case, the illness and the sadness about the way my military career ended. Um, about thinking about them, thinking why, why are they issues for me? What, what is it? And in my case, it's, it felt like my identity had been taken away from me. You know, the uniform, the, the thing that I told people I was, I'm an army officer. Uh, well, not anymore, I was. Uh, I'm an education officer, I was proud of that because of the educational background of my family. I wanted to, to, to deliver educational support and service to, to soldiers because I thought they were valuable and they could seek value from it and go forward in their own careers and their own lives. And so, that, you know, that, that just, it was just my essence and it's what I wanted to do, it was a vocation. And then when some of that's taken away, as I say, it was, it was an issue for me. So I needed to work through that and I did it narratively. So I went right back to my earliest memory, which is three, um, in the countryside, I'll come back to that. My parents were in the police, uniform public service. My uncle was a Royal Engineer, another uncle a Royal Marine, military uniforms. Uh, my mum went into university academic work. My aunt was a teacher, funny, funny old thing. I brought the two together yeah. and became an army education officer. So I worked that out. I sort of thought, okay, well, that's why I joined the army. I could explain that. I grew up in the countryside, you know, and, it, and the army meant I could just kind of bimble around the countryside for, for a bit longer as well, you know, great. Um, so that explains to me why I joined it. And, it, and by virtue of that, explain why I found it so difficult to leave because it's, it, it was almost like I'd, I'd been brought up to do that. And suddenly that has been denied me and I didn't know where I was going to go. So I worked through that narratively, it took, you know, many hundreds of thousands of words written about it until I got to that point of working out why it was such an issue for me. And once I'd done that, I kind of integrated it into my current situation. I thought, well, I'm not in the army anymore. I can't, there's nothing I can do about that. But I can still give something back. Uh, and I can potentially use it as a springboard to another career, whether it be in academia or, or helping veterans in policy work or practical work. I don't know how that's going to work yet. We'll see. But I feel like it's meaningful and it might go somewhere. Um, and so that gives me a plan or a springboard or something to be able to look forward to a brighter future. So it's really about looking at the past and narrating it to yourself and to others. And that can be either talking about it in a group with a bunch of other veterans or, or military leavers or in a PTSD support group or whatever it happens to be. Uh, you know, it's like psychotherapy in a way, but you're, you know, you're, I guess I'm not an expert, but you're talking through it. In my case, I, I wrote about it because it give, gave me more time to think about it, rearrange things, put things in order. Um, and so that's a, that's a narrative repair, which Neymar then says can, can lead to post-traumatic uh, post growth. In my case, I'm feeling a lot better about things now because you know, I might get a doctoral degree out of it. I'm, I'm submitting my thesis uh, next month. All being well, it seems to be being well received. 
I'll pass the, uh, the VIVA, pass the examination, maybe with some corrections, and emerge with a doctorate in education. But more than that, I'll, I'll have answered my own questions and I'll hopefully be able to use that to help other people. So I will have grown and I want to help other people grow by thinking about and, the and process. That's it. And that, I think the issue that, I mean, I, when, when I went through my own rent resettlement process, that what I could have done with was, was examples of people who have trans, transitioned, people who I would say are successful veterans, people that have gone on to live fulfilling lives and rewarding lives that they see. And why isn't that why isn't that being integrated to, you know, that person that sat there in the resettlement centre and there's a masterclass from somebody who's gone out within the last five or ten years and said, listen, guys, this is, this is what happened to me. Peaks and falls. Do you think there's a place for that? Do you think Absolutely. A yeah. And I, and I, I think there is, um, in Catterick, there's been a, um, and a SAFA have been involved in this, I, I believe, um, a body system in, instituted where those mentors will be assigned to I think it initially started uh, in that the mentors were assigned to people that were judged of being at risk, the sort of traffic light situation that you're talking about. Um, now, I don't know how far that's been expanded, but I would argue that it should be um, it, it, it should be part of this more holistic psychoeducational transition course or transition program that I talked about before. Where, and, and, and it's not just me saying this, there have been reports in, um, I think, under the auspices of the Forces in Mind Trust um, last year in 2018, saying that a buddy system should be in, instituted with people who have successfully, in inverted commas, transition. I mean, it's difficult to define success, I think. Mm -hmm. But people who appear, certainly, to be doing well in transition, you know, might just come and meet people on the, uh, on the transition programme and say, you know, I will take on five of you. You don't have to ever speak to me again, but this is, this is what I've done. This is what I, this is how I got to where I did. I had one or two problems. This is how I dealt with them. If you ever want me to come and speak to you again, or you want to pick up the phone or whatever, these are my contact details. Anytime, six months, a year, five years, 10 years, assuming we're all still around, not a problem. There is talk about doing that. And I agree, I think that would be very, very useful and it should happen which is uh, a very long way of saying yes <laughs> to your uh, question. Um, and finally, I'm going to go back to the questions just to make sure to talk about charities. Um, obviously, the charities, it, it can be a bit overwhelming as to what's out there within regards to the veterans charity sector. Can you just give me a rundown of your views of the veterans charity sector, what they're doing positively to help our veterans and what maybe... Um, be a bit of a diversion or, or a bit of a you know where could they focus their energies where could the charity set to be focusing to be more effective for our veterans i i like to think and i uh, and i haven't met anyone involved in any of the service charities um that has dissuaded me from this idea i like to think that like in the mod you know anyone involved in in service the service charity um sector is doing it with the best of intentions i.e to help service personnel and veterans um I think the issue is, and again, it's been recognised that there's so many out there um, that can be bewildering for service people and veterans. Um, so it's a question of how you link service people and veterans to that, and there have been moves to, to do that, the Veterans Gateway, etc., cetera, um, being one. Um, I'm not sure it's entirely as well coordinated as it needs to be yet. There's still difficulty, but they're trying to do their best. There are, of course, issues with resourcing. You know, there's a finite amount of money out there, and many of the charities are competing for those finite resources, and that might mean that some are getting more and some are getting less, and some, therefore, are not as effective as they might like to be, etc. That, that creates a problem. There's a little bit of competition there, perhaps. Um, and because of that, I can't get away from the, from the feeling that actually it shouldn't be left to the charity sector to pick up the pieces. Um, you, you know, the service life is all about commitment, selfless commitment, one of the, the values and standards of the British Army, and I'm sure it's the same in the other services as well. When service people have been asked to and do give everything, then I think the least that they can spe expect is for the MOD to give, give something back. I don't know, I'm, com I'm comfortable with the idea that that stops 
at midnight on the day that someone leaves the armed forces. It's going to cost money. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take increased uh, human resource, etc., etc. But I think the MOD should take on the mantle for looking after service people that need it beyond that second past midnight when they become a civilian. I think it, they owe it to those service people and they owe it to society because when things go wrong, it's not just the service person that suffers. It's their families and it's society um, in terms of criminal justice issues and, and homelessness, etc., etc. So uh, the MOD needs to do more, certainly. They're trying to, they just need to be resourced to do it.